Hi, welcome back aboard the Earthmo. I'm Randall and today we are back at the computer and we're going to be doing some more hands-on examples of campaign prep, game prep, things like that. Today we're going to be focusing on starting the design of a dungeon. I think this is going to be a two-part series. In this first video we are going to generate some ideas for what the dungeon is going to be. And we're gonna do that by starting off with this article that I've read um, that really kind of starts your, your dungeon framework by creating a rumor table. And then the idea is you have that kind of information to use as a blueprint to make your dungeon. So the hope is at the end of this video, we are going to have some details and a blueprint for what we want our dungeon framework to be. And then in that follow-up video, I will actually do the keen of the dungeon and then we'll have our adventure location ready to go. The dungeon that we're looking at is probably going to be 10 to 15 rooms in size. Not a huge dungeon, but something that's kind of an adventure location that maybe takes up one or two sessions of play. So without further ado, let's go ahead and make our rumor-based dungeon by starting on that blueprint. Okay, here we are at the computer, and I was reading through the latest issue of Knock. I think you can, hopefully you can see it here. Uh, this is issue number four, and I came across this article called Making Good Rumors and Later Dungeons. You can see it's by Morgan Miller. It's actually from a blog post. Most of Knock's material is originally content created in kind of the blogosphere and then pulled into the magazine and formatted in fun different ways. So I'll have a link to both Knock and the free blog post. So the idea behind this is Morgan has put together a framework of kind of a structure for a rumor table that you can use, that you can sort of fill out that rumor table. And then from there, that will sort of give you kind of some ideas on things and elements that you want to include inside your dungeon. In the case of true rumors, you know, that would be an element incorporated into the dungeon. And in the case of partially true rumors, you could include something similar or maybe the thing, but with a twist. And then false rumors, you know, obviously would be excluded from the dungeon. But in most cases in, in the rumor table, they are going to be true, partially true, or a chance of being so. So let's go ahead and go through the framework real quick, and then we'll kind of dive into some ideas on what we want to generate for it. Uh, Dungeon Fruit is the name of Morgan's blog, and this is the post, Making Good Rumors. And then down here, he has kind of the table of rumor prompts. So the first one we have is a true rumor about something that lies below the surface or the entrance to the dungeon. So some sort of area within your dungeon that is true. And then similarly to it, but partially true, uh, another area within your dungeon. Kind of giving information about the structure to your players if they get these rumors. There's a couple facts about the history of the dungeon. So a true fact about the history of the dungeon and a partially true fact about the history of the dungeon. So again, we're kind of generating some information about the context of the dungeon and then, you know, maybe giving it some twists. And then we go on to true facts about current events in the dungeon and partially true facts. So you can kind of get the structure here. We have true and partially true. Then we go on to a blatantly false or somewhat ridiculous rumor. So this is something that would be like a tall tale, like someone in the, the local tavern is, is trying to tell some tale to impress the adventures when, you know, it's just completely made up. So this is one where you can have a little bit of fun with it. And then the last ones are a little bit more uh, randomized. So you roll a D6 and then based on your result, it's either a true, partially true or false rumor. And then you get... Uh, rumor about a specific treasure in the dungeon. So of course your dungeon should have treasures. So for number eight here, I'm going to go ahead and roll to see if we have a true, partially true or false. So rolling, I got a two, which is a partially true rumor about a specific treasure in the dungeon. So rolling for entry number nine here, we will roll. I got a one. So that's a true rumor about some flora or fauna in the dungeon. He kind of calls out here, maybe this is some sort of recurring environmental hazard or some sort of interactive element in the dungeon. That's cool. So ours in this case is going to be true. 
And then lastly, we are rolling for number 10. So let's roll that. I got a five, which is a false rumor about an NPC in the dungeon. Okay, so some denizen that maybe lives there, we have a false rumors. Okay, so we need to fill out these rumors to be well on our way to having kind of this nice setup for our rumor-based dungeon. If you're enjoying the video so far, it would really help me out if you give the video a like and consider subscribing if you wanna see more hands-on content or creation examples like this in the future. I'm having fun doing them, but if people like the videos, I'd really like to know that. So go ahead and give it a thumbs up if you're enjoying it. Now, before I get to crafting my rumor table, I do need some more context for this dungeon because we're gonna be starting completely from scratch. So I don't have any ideas on what this dungeon is like and trying to make rumors out of thin air is gonna be way too hard for me. So I'm gonna to turn to another free resource that I've used a lot on this channel before if you've watched it, and that is Kevin Crawford's Worlds Without Number game, but it also has a lot of great tools for a game master to build sandboxes, build dungeons, build worlds, tons of random tables in there. And the best part is you can get a totally free copy of the PDF. I'll put links down below. There's also a deluxe version, which has some more stuff in it, which is pretty cool. But the free version has everything that we'll be using here today. So you can just get that one and check that out. Jumping over to the correct page, we're going to go over to the ruins section. Ruins are dungeons. And we're going to start off by rolling some ruin tags to get just some general themes or ideas on what this dungeon could possibly be. So I'm going to go ahead and roll uh, two D100 rolls to get a set of tags and we'll figure out what it is from there. Rolling the first one. I got a 19. So looking at our table, that is dire tombs. Okay, so this is some sort of crypt or uh, necropolis or something like that. Um, that obviously pulls in a lot of ideas immediately. And going ahead and rolling our second one, I got a 45, which is hospitable natives. Okay, that's interesting. Let's. I think I know what that is, but let's just go ahead and jump down to get a little bit more context on that. Hospitable natives. While not all denizens of the ruins are friendly, there's at least one faction known to be willing to host guests and negotiate for favors. Okay, interesting. What kind of friendly denizen would be in a tomb? I don't know, but uh, that gives us some interesting ideas to start off of. So the tags give us some nice context, but I want to use one more tool in Worlds Without Number, and that is the one roll ruin generator. So Kevin has a lot of these one roll generators in the book. This one is for dungeons. And the idea is you use one of each dice. So there's like a D6, a D8, D10. You get the idea. And then you get some context based off of the questions and the random table. So let's go ahead and roll through these to figure out what we're going to get. So the first one is what do the locals think of it? So rolling our D6. We got a five, so it's a lure to the greedy and the reckless. Okay, interesting. Maybe there's some sort of fabled treasure there or something like that that seems to draw a lot of treasure hunters there. How did it become ruined? We're going to go ahead and roll our D8. I got a one, so it was invaded and destroyed by its enemies. Okay, so why would someone attack a tomb? and you know what was the reason that compelled them to do so could be some history or ideas there that we might need to think about d10 why hasn't it been plundered yet got a two it's cursed plagued or has some miasma i can see you know a curse would play pretty well into a tomb maybe the curse was invoked when they tried to invade and destroy it and now, you know, there's undead in there, right? Because these invaders that tried to attack this tomb have uh, been cursed into some sort of un unlife. D4, how old is the ruin? I got a two, so generations old at the least. All right, so it's somewhat old. 
what kind of basic ruin is it? This is a D12. I'm actually going to skip this one. We know it's a tomb. I'm just going to, you know, 12 right there is a tomb or a necropolis. Uh, we rolled that on the tags. You could roll to maybe try to combine the two, but since this is such a small location, uh, I'm just going to skip this roll. You know, you, you can do what you want. Um, you could roll this first and then roll the tag second, but we did it in the other order. So that's, that's what we're going to go with. Lastly, D20, who has used this ruin before? I got a seven a black market trader to bandits or worse. Okay. Interesting. So we have this hospitable native that lives in the dungeon. Is it this, the black market trader or something like that? Okay. So let's just quickly recap our context and then I will go and draft up the rumor table and share kind of the ideas that I came up with as I thought through it. So we have a tomb. We rolled that on the tags and we know that it's cursed. We rolled, um, why hasn't it plundered yet? So there's like a curse that's in the tomb. And we also know that there is someone that isn't immediately hostile inhabiting the dungeon or perhaps nearby the dungeon. And we've seen that maybe a black market trader has used the dungeon before. So is the hospitable person that black market trader or not? It's something we'll have to decide as we're making up the rumors. You know, maybe some of these contexts could be alluring to our false rumors rather than the true ones. So I'm going to go ahead and think on this for a little bit. And I'll come back with the table made out and we'll go ahead and go through the structure and what I came up with. Okay. I'm back. I've thought through the format of the rumors and I've come up with some ideas. Some of it is kind of related to my campaign, but I'll try to leave it a little bit generic. So if you wanted to steal this, you can, um, but just go through the ideas. So the first is we have a true rumor about what lies below the surface of our entrance to our dungeon. And I decided that this would kind of be like a barrow type tomb. So it's underneath the hill. And then at the top of the hill, there's a lone kind of like petrified tree. So it's a stone tree. Underneath it is the tomb of a person known as the bright basilisk. So resplendent with his treasures of divination. So the basilisk is a part of a noble house in my world. And they are kind of these uh, magic sorcerers and they have kind of a lot of powers of, of divination. I thought, okay, that would be a good idea to lure in these treasures that these players might be interested in of this sort of historical figure. So then we had a partially true rumor and I went up with, so within the crypt lies a communal chamber. Uh, that allows one to ask questions directly to Gaia. Gaia is one of the gods in my world. And uh, that is a partially true rumor. So the commune or the person speaking uh, does not speak directly with a god, but rather they see some sort of vision or omen to an answer of their questions. So we have kind of this divination aspect going on uh, with this figure and, and an element tied into the tomb. So kind of a little theme that we can build in here. So we have a true fact about the history of the dungeon. And this is one that made sense to really tie in that it was sort of attacked and destroyed, uh, by invaders or enemies of the bright basilisk, right? So, uh, the tomb was desecrated by the enemies of house Beaumont, Beaumont, is the noble family that the bright basilisk belonged to. They feared the bright basilisk powers in life and in death. And that's true. They did. They, that's why they attacked it. They felt this figure was powerful enough to have influence beyond the grave. So they thought by destroying the tomb, they might be able to prevent that from happening. Then we have a partial truth about the history. So in this case, I wrote, that the desecrators of the bright basilisk tomb are cursed and they stock the tombs as stone men for all of time. So kind of leaning into that. The basilisk is a moniker and it's kind of the symbol or the coat of arms for house Beaumont. But I figured well, you could lean into that. Maybe the curse was to turn them into stone men. And in this case, it's partially true. They were cursed, but they're not stone. They are roaming the halls as undead. So kind of sticking to a more 
true denizen of a crypt. Next, we have a true fact on current events in the dungeon. So I thought for this one, we could lean into that role we had where the locals thought of it as like a lure for the crazy and the greedy. So in this case, who's, who's greedy? Adventuring parties. So an adventuring party was lured by the prize of the bright basilisk treasures. Recently, they entered the crypt or the tomb a few weeks ago, and they were never seen again. And that's true. So now we have this party element that we can bake into the dungeon as well. They're probably all dead, but who knows when we get to key in the dungeon, we can think about that a little bit further. Then we have a partial truth about the current events in the dungeon. So we had this sort of hospitable figure that we haven't brought up yet. I thought, what if we had a crazed hermit that lives near the entrance of the tomb? and he's gone mad living so close to the curse-laden tomb. And that's partially true. Aylmer the Accursed is the name I've given him, does live near the crypt entrance, but he's not mad at all. I, my first thoughts on this is maybe he is a cleric or a priest that's come to try to get rid of the curse on the tomb. Next, we have our blatantly false or ridiculous rumor. And on this one, I leaned into that black market aspect a little bit. So the idea is on new moons, the tomb operates as this black market where all different notorious thieves, bandit gangs, and scoundrels ply their wares. And this one is totally false. Uh, I didn't, for such a small dungeon, again, we're trying to make this maybe 10 to 15 rooms. I didn't really want to go into the whole black market aspect too much, um, but it's an interesting tale that might come into play, or maybe maybe there are figures that have heard this rumor, and now they're coming to the tomb as well in search of this black market. Next, we have a partially true rumor about a specific treasure in the dungeon. In this case, I thought, well, what would be something that would be interesting, particularly for this figure, the bright basilisk, Thought, well, maybe there was an amulet that he wore that protected him in life and in death. So because he is a magic user, uh, maybe he had some sort of amulet that provided him a bonus to armor class or something like that. Um, that could be within the tomb. That could be a nice treasure for the party's mage or uh, someone who doesn't wear armor. And this is partially true. The amulet does have some sort of protective capabilities but it doesn't protect the body beyond life. So if they're dead, it's not gonna try to revive them or uh, save their soul from being devoured or something like that. It has some protective capabilities, but doesn't protect them beyond life. Next, we had rolled a true rumor about some flora or fauna in the dungeon. And this one, I decided that maybe we could go with some sort of flora, uh, not something I use a lot in my dungeon. So I thought, you know, why not go with something like that? And I just made up a flower. I said, I call it dusk violet. So there's said to be dusk violet growing in the tomb. It's worth collecting some if you're up against any undead. And that's true. It's sort of this plant that kind of wards off undead, kind of like Wolfsbane does for werewolves. Maybe this has some sort of effect against the undead and nicely because there are undead in the tomb maybe the players can use it to their advantage as they're navigating the tomb and i thought it could also kind of operate maybe there's like one room where this is growing and the undead wouldn't follow the players into that space so it's kind of like maybe a safe spot for them if they can figure it out so something to consider including in our design as well and then lastly, we have a false rumor about an NPC in the dungeon. And I went with this one. I went back to our NPC that we've already made, Aylmer the Accursed. So for the exchange of basilisk parts, again, leaning into the basilisk moniker of the figure that is resting in the tomb, but in this case, a literal basilisk monsters, if you get their parts, so venom or fangs or eyeballs, and exchange those to Aylmer, who lives in the tomb, he can weave and direct the tomb's curse on a specific person. And this is a false rumor. He can do no such thing. And that's right. I already kind of revealed it, but he's trying to actually remove the curse from the tomb. So he can't weave it against your enemies, unfortunately, but uh, it's a false rumor. So it's kind of fun. Maybe the players show up with basilisk parts and want some sort of curse cast, but uh, they, they're out of luck.
Okay, so that's our rumor table. It was an interesting method. I actually had a lot of fun with it. I think Morgan has a really nice kind of structure here. Uh, if you can get some ideas for what your dungeon is like, filling this out is pretty easy. I Once I rolled up those details in our Worlds Without Number toolkit, I didn't have too much trouble uh, going through these 10 and making some ideas for them. Just sort of went with my gut on kind of the first or second idea I had. And I think we have a nice structure. This will really help me when I go to key up the dungeon and we can kind of rely on this to sort of add some context and ideas on what we want to include in it. Uh, hopefully that was interesting to you and fun. Uh, consider checking out the method. I'll include uh, links to uh, the blog post in the video. I'll also include a link to a Google Doc that has sort of the details I rolled for the dungeons kind of structure. And then I'll also include this rumor table in there as well if you want to check that out and key your own dungeon off of that. If you do, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to see what you come up with. Uh, otherwise, in part two, we will actually go through and key this dungeon up. I'll find a map and then we will go ahead and key the dungeon based off of the details we've come up with here and maybe some other random roles as we go along through the design process of it. So if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. It really does help the channel out a lot. Consider subscribing if you wanna see part two or see other sandbox content. Consider checking out Enchanted Nimbus, my monthly newsletter. Thanks for hopping aboard the Earth Boat. I'll see you in the next one.